interviewing him and Nandan together. Uh, and since then, we've, uh, we've gone on to oh, do yeah. many, many, many of interviews course. on marking the many milestones that, uh, that Infosys has clocked in its, uh, in its journey. So Mr. Murthy, uh, wonderful to see you, and thank you very much for joining us here today. Uh, it's, it's interesting that we're talking about innovation, we're talking about uh, uh, India's role in the global innovation map, uh, and this takes me back to the journey that we began on my show called Young Turks, which turned 20 uh, on the 1st of June. Uh, we are India's longest running show on startups and entrepreneurship, and I would imagine the world's longest running show on startups and entrepreneurship. So we've been a believer in Indian innovation uh, for a while now, as you can see. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that uh, in many ways, what Mr. Murthy and his co-founders at Infosys did inspired a whole generation of young entrepreneurs. I remember you told me once that uh, when I asked him, I said, what made the Infosys story special? And he said, when people looked at us, they said, if these seven jokers can do it, then so can we. So I think that, that, was, that was what they really offered to a post-tribalization India was the audacity of hope. And I think it inspired a generation of entrepreneurs to go the startup route. So Mr. Murthy, that's exactly where I want to start with you. Uh, post-1991, when India opened up, the economy changed, and we saw lots of uh, different developments take place. The Indian economy started to integrate with yeah. the world. And we've seen several waves of entrepreneurship in India post that. Yeah. And every wave or every cycle if I could call it that, people say it's different this time around. And it depends on which camp you belong to, whether you're the optimist camp or the pessimist camp. And I know you're always on the optimist side. So if you look at what's happening today, uh, what do you believe is truly different about this cycle or this wave? Well, you know, I must admit that I have tremendous admiration for today's entrepreneurs. I personally think, I don't know what my co-founders think, but I personally think that today's entrepreneurs are much smarter than I was for two very important reasons. Actually, there are three ingredients for success as an entrepreneur, but I'll talk about the first two. Success of an entrepreneur comes first because of access to customer or the ease with which you can sell your product. That is the market access. The second important ingredient for success of an entrepreneur is access to talent. During our time, thanks to a certain set of technological uh, revolution that took place, that is, uh, introduction of super mini computers, which performed like the mainframes, but were very inexpensive, and second, inexpensive OLTP monitors. These two enable the explosion of large commercial applications for departmental computing as well as computing based on commercial applications in small and medium corporations. So for us, market access was easy. And second, talent access was again very easy because, you know, at PCS, where I was a general manager, I had about 16 IIT graduates, and most of them from IIT Bombay, including Nandan, Arvind K, this fellow, that fellow, etc. Because there was hardly any job in India at that time. But today, I mean, Sam knows. It is so difficult to first get to the market because there's so much of competition from so many smart entrepreneurs. Second, it is so difficult to get access to talent. So I find that as the main difference. 
there is a second difference and that is or a third difference that is because vc money is easily available today that's the third ingredient for entrepreneurs in our time there was no vc there was no bank loan all of that there was sudha murti with 10000 rupees exactly <laughs> but today because there is lot of money chasing these ideas and those vcs also have a job to do i mean they have to report to their bosses that you know that they have been successful they have provided this kind of return etc so there is a certain pressure on entrepreneurs to to succeed as early as possible and second we in india have not done a good job of estimating the market size mm. we have traditionally or by habit rather overestimated the markets i mean you know sherry very well how in the middle 90s so many corporations came from outside assuming there were 200 million middle class indians who are willing to buy and they found it was not there the same story has taken place even today so we have overestimated the the market size also we probably do not have good market research companies that can give us an accurate estimate of the market opportunity with the result on the one hand there is pressure on the vcs to show uh returns rangaisia he knows that pressure and on the other hand there is a tendency to overestimate and third ipos have somehow been taken as a surrogate for the next round of financing mm. i think that's not a good thing because ipo comes with tremendous responsibilities i still remember before we went public i sat down with nandan chris everybody said look having an ipo is brings owners responsibilities there are so many people who have very little money and they would put faith in us and put in whatever little or meager disposable income they have therefore it is very very important for us to give them suitable return but today that whole thing has gone therefore you see the entrepreneurs being in a jam with pressure from vcs with looking at ipo as the next level of uh, Uh, next round of financing and finally as i said inability to uh, to estimate the market size and invariably your costs go but your revenues don't go up therefore you make losses mm. and therefore the market capitalization comes down Well, that's my analysis i may be wrong the, the, and i think that's a very comprehensive analysis of the situation that we find ourselves or that many founders find themselves today but several interesting aspects that you brought up as a murti and i think i agree with you on the overestimation part and that's what i want to start by addressing with you you know every day there are reports and you know you say that there are not enough good reports to suggest what the real market size and what the real market opportunity is but on the other hand you have all kinds of reports and nothing is less than 2 trillion 5 trillion dollar opportunity every sector is a trillion dollar opportunity where do you believe uh, the variance between the real opportunity and what is estimated as the opportunity where do you believe the gap is the most significant today in which sectors you know i am i don't have a crystal ball and i am not very good in in uh, forecasting of these things at the macro level though i must say i did a reasonably good job at infosys at the micro level but what i would do is that i would request these wonderful entrepreneurs who are assembled here and for elsewhere 
to look at a model which I developed pretty early in the life of Infosys, and that was called PSPD. The, the first P was all about predictability of revenues, having a good forecasting algorithm, ensuring that that data has come from the ground level, making sure that that is checked and rechecked so that that forecasting is reasonably accurate. Second, S stands for sustainability. Sustainability is all about once you have forecast a certain revenue, your salespeople will have to beat the payment and make cold calls, convince the customer or the prospect of the, the value of what you're delivering and accept the, uh, the, the, you know, get the customer to accept your product or service. Then you were uh, manufacturing people will have to produce the product with the requisite quality and deliver it to the customer on time. And then your finance people will have to raise the invoice on time and your sales people will have to collect that money on time. That is about sustainability, mm. yes. The third thing is what is called profitability, that second key. My own belief is if you can't have, if you can't make money hand over fist, it's not worth doing business. When I left, our net income margin was 31%. Of course, our revenue was also smaller. But the point I'm making is every day, every day, there would be focus not just on top line, but also on product and the bottom line, which requires controlling of, of costs, looking at whether every expense that you do is bringing the best value for money, etc., etc. And then the final thing is D. D is for de-risking. That is, do not depend too much on one product if you can help. I mean, I, I, at the probably earliest level you can't do that, or one market, one geography, one region, one key employee, one key customer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So create a portfolio of geographies, regions, technologies, products, services, whatever you can, so that you minimize risk. I would say that if we can do, use this model of PSPD, obviously you're all bright, therefore you will improve it by leaps and bounds. Then I do believe that as the CEOs, if you say, I will look at P, I will look at S, I will look at second P and D, once a week, and ask people deep questions, I do believe that you would have enhanced the probability of your success. PSPD, predictability, sustainability, profitability, and de-risking, and I think these continue to be relevant in the times that we live in. And let Absolutely. me address let me address the second P, the profitability aspect of it. Because you talked about the easy money that, uh, and it's been an era of abundance the last few years, especially the liquidity uh, has been very, very strong, taps have yeah. been flowing, and just about everyone has raised money. And Perhaps it's also made it easier for people to take decisions that are not in the best interest of the company because you've got this free cash that's coming your way. The focus on profitability and many entrepreneurs that we speak to today say, look, you know, at this point in time, it's better to go for top line growth, focus on getting market share and so on and so forth. And the profitability will follow. It's almost as if it's a switch that you can turn on or off and it's not as easy as that. So what is your message uh, to entrepreneurs, to startup founders at this point in time, especially 
as the situation has turned, as money becomes a less available commodity, uh, as liquidity starts to dry up, and we are now perhaps heading into a longish winter. I don't know how long it's going to last. I'm not going to forecast. But what is your message then on profitability and the path to profitability? You know, first of all, me answering that question is probably not fair to all this wonderful entrepreneurs who are assembled here for a very important reason. And that is, I operated in the services model mm. and I depended on the export market. On the other hand, these wonderful people assembled here are focusing, many of them, on product or productized models in the domestic market where the disposable incomes are low, where the competition is high. So therefore, me giving big lecture on how to improve profitability may not be fair to them, but having put in that caveat, let me say uh, something further. You know, I have always believed that as economists have told me for the last 50 years, price is what you pay, value is what you expect from that product or service, it doesn't matter. This applies to both products and service. So I understood and I used to tell all my colleagues often, that our challenge is to focus on how we can improve the value delivered to our customers in whatever we do. And if we did that, and if we try to enhance the ratio of value to price, that is value or price, as much as your corporation can do, then there is a possibility for you to enhance your price also. I'll tell you, give you a simple example. I sell a uh, gizmo at $100 and I convince Claude that my product will give him a value of $200. I use my model and show him. And you come and you tell him, you show him using your smarter model that you will give cloth $300 of value, but you're going to charge him $120. Now, the business value to price ratio of my proposal is 200 over 100, which is 2. On the other hand, yours is 300 over 120, which is 2.5. Mm. I am almost confident that clothes will go with your offer. You know why? Because he is getting a much higher value for money that he has paid. Now, the beauty is, you have got 20% higher value than me. Therefore, he is a winner, you are a winner. So, therefore, I would say that my request to all these wonderful people assembled here is, at all points of time, please look at a concept called business value addition or consumer value addition, whatever. That is, at every point of time, when your younger colleagues come to you and say, I have come out with this wonderful product, you simply ask him, him or her to explain and do some modeling and explain the kind of value in whatever rupees and paise or dollars and cents, whatever it is, to the customer and the price and that ratio and ask him or her to see how 
he or she can increase that ratio of value to pride, then I would say that you would be in a position to manage tough times. Of course, there are other issues like as leaders, you have to lead in austerity, you have to lead in sacrifice, you have to lead by example, in, in uh, innovation, you have to lead by example, in hard work, in discipline, all of those things are there, I don't need to uh, re-emphasize them. But I thought I would bring this concept of business value addition to our discussion. Yeah, I think that's an important uh, value addition that you have brought to the conversation as well, Mr. Murthy. I want to address the other aspect that you spoke of, that many uh, mistake, perhaps, uh, IPO as a financing event. Uh, and in the context of where we are today, there is a strong pipeline of IPOs now. When they will go through, given the volatile times that we live in, I'm not sure. But what is the message that you would like to leave founders and entrepreneurs at this point in time as they look at when to IPO, uh, with how much to IPO, uh, and, and what and how much to put on the table and how much to take off? You know, the philosophy that uh, we used at Infosys was the day you take one paisa from an outsider, who well, is not part of your group, we were seven people, the day we took one paisa from the eighth person outside, the ball game changes. Because he or she is not part of the daily deliberations, he or she has no time to get into every detail. He or she has trusted us with his or her money. Therefore, I said that ball game changes. So you have to operate like the trustees of the outsider's money. Let me tell you our own experience when we were raising funds from family and friends. We raised approximately about 60 lakhs from family and friends. And I think I did about 65%, Nandan did about 35%, others didn't participate in that. But whenever we went to my so-called well-to-do friend, they would say, will you guarantee me this return, explain this thing, show me the model, this, that, etc. On the other hand, when I went to my sisters, my friends who were not that you know, well-educated, that uh, well-informed, they would say, are you certain that you will use this money carefully? Are you certain that you will not spend this money recklessly? And I would say, look, we will treat it as better than our own money. And it was the lower middle class, friends of mine, relatives of mine, who contributed this money. So the day before we went public, I sat down with all my colleagues and said, folks, we cannot sleep well until we redeem our pledge to these people. And, you know, we had wonderful people. I mean, at that time, Mohan had still not joined us, but there was G.R. Naik, there was Nandan, there were other people who had done an excellent job. Nandan had done a very good job of forecasting the revenue. And G.R. Naik grilled him. <laughs> He was an old uh, school person <clears throat> and at the end he said, okay, I agree. And, you know, the reality was we exceeded our own projections by, I think, a factor of two, if not, if I'm not wrong, but, you know, I may be wrong. Let me tell you that until we, those three years got over, 
because then only I could breathe properly. Because at the end of the day, I, you know, stock market is like a, like a treadmill. I don't know of anybody who goes and says, I will invest in this stock for it to go down. I don't know anybody. Even if the PE is 1500, which some of the companies have today, that person is expecting either the earnings to go up, even if the PE may not go up, even if PE comes down, earnings to go up, or the PE to go up. In other words, he or she is expecting the stock price to go up. Nobody invests for health. <laughs> so therefore, I would say that having an IPO is not fun. Is not to say, I have become, I am worth this many billion dollars, that's all bullshit. <laughs> because this is all illusory. This is all illusory. I've seen so many people who went up, who came down, all of that. So best thing is to be very, very practical about these issues. Think of the poorest retail investors. As Mahatma Gandhi used to say, Mahatma Gandhi used to say, when you take this decision, think of the poorest person and the impact of your decision on that person. So therefore, I would request all the wonderful people assembled here to think of the, the poorest retail investor before you decide on the RPO because you owe that person you were a, a tremendous responsibility to redeem your pledge. That's what I would say. Well, it's going to take a while for many, many to redeem that pledge in the market that we are in today. But that, that is certainly good advice, Mr. Murthy. Thank uh, you. You know, and since I just want to continue with, with the challenging times that we are in and, and dwell on your experience. And I remember very clearly you told me once that uh, uh, during tough times, let the bad news take the elevator and let yep. the good news take the stairs. Uh, and I think this is a dilemma that many founders find themselves in currently. How much of the bad news do you share? When do you share it? Uh, do you go public with it or not? Uh, you know, or, or do you continue to sort of say, no, things are on track and good? And w what is it that you would tell them at this point in time, given the fact that there is going to be a, a difficult, prolonged difficult period? You know, I have personally felt, I don't know, maybe some of my colleagues may have a different view, that it is always best to bring the bad news early and proactively. If you didn't do that, you would not be able to sleep well. And the, there is always an anxiety in the other party's mind because they also have sources to get some access to information. It's not like you are the only one, right? So therefore, my view is always bring bad news early and properly. Let me give you one example. In 1995, Shireen, I took a very tough decision. I was the only person who took that decision. I say there was Mohan, there was Nandan, there was Kriv, there was Shibu, Fanish, everybody was sitting there. They were all against it. Of respectfully declining to continue business with a highly respected, uh, uh, you know, uh, top ten corporation in the world. Because I thought it was not fair. I thought we wouldn't be fair to our employees. I thought we wouldn't be fair to our other customers. I thought we wouldn't be able to invest, etc., etc. But once we took that decision, Nandan and I, we went to Mumbai 
and we held an analyst meet on our own nobody expected us it was totally voluntary and we told them that look we have taken this decision not to continue with this highly respected company and they formed 25% of our revenue we had gone public in 1993 and this was 1995 may and we laid out a plan on how we would bridge that gap and grow fast our share price didn't suffer because so many people told us at that time that you are the first company that we have seen in india which brought bad news to the, to the table similarly you know we had kept aside certain amount of money to start our office in boston uh, those days you know rbi had took its own turn so my colleague nandan no eh, sorry mohan said why don't we invest it in secondary market <laughs> you know i have tremendous respect for him he is one of the brightest that i have come across i said okay we lost some money so there was a discussion should we disclose or not i said friends disclosure transparency means disclosing a bad news transparency is not disclosing good news so i said we have and we disclosed there was no issue we didn't suffer so my request to all of you is it is better to be known as a respected individual than a very smart individual <laughs> so even if people say look you're not that smart it's okay but if people say we can trust you we can trust this man i can tell you that has much bigger value for you than being saying saying you are the smartest guy so my request to the wonderful entrepreneurs is please disclose let as shireen put it let the bad news take the elevator but let the good news take the stairs that's what i would say or when in doubt disclose i think that principle is very very important when in doubt disclose don't argue don't spend too much time on that it will hurt you it didn't hurt us but even if it hurts you today you would have it is like going to the doctor at an early stage and then the doctor will find a solution for you but if you keep quiet if you hid it then it will be this thing. i mean we we have experienced that also you know, anyway <laughs> so yeah. well continuing with the with the life lessons and you know since we were talking about arguments and identifying problems and addressing problems yeah. what are the issues that we are seeing today and i think we have seen previously uh, in in past uh, companies and past instances as well Uh, is disagreements sometimes at the board level sometimes between investors and founders sometimes between founders themselves uh, in a situation like that and i know that you know you you've got a mantra on that that uh, you know when when in doubt dif- disclose but also when in doubt you know trust the data uh, and yep. and uh, you know that that's that's the direction to take Correct. but Correct. how do you how do you institutionalize a, a mechanism of grievance redressal how do you institutionalize a mechanism of dialogue so that you can in fact address some of these issues nip them in the bud so that they don't fester they don't lead into something ugly how can you amicably resolve disagreements you know culture is the toughest thing to change 
No wonder Professor Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for lunch. You can put in great strategy, you can do this, you can do that. But changing the culture of a corporation, a community, a nation is the toughest thing. I mean, we have all seen in India, right? Nehru wanted a clean Ganga, then Indira Gandhi wanted a clean Ganga, then uh, next Prime Minister and Sri Modi, who has been working very hard to make a clean Ganga. It, you know, it's not happened. Why? Because it is impacted by the culture of Indians, of dirtying our rivers, etc., etc. So similarly, even in a corporation, changing the culture is very tough. But in a culture like India, people by and large follow the leader as long as that leader is in that chair. That's the reality of India. That leader goes, people go back to their world habits. So the leaders, all of you have a tremendous responsibility, two responsibilities. One, to lead by example in creating a culture of fairness, transparency, accountability, austerity, you know, honesty, etc., etc., you know, speed, imagination, quick decision-making, all of that. Second, to choose the right successor. That, if you do not choose the right successor, there are many examples, I don't need to get into that, then all the wonderful thing that you have done may see a hiccup. So therefore, I would say, lead by example, that's what Mahatma Gandhi taught all of us. In my opinion, Mahatma Gandhi was the finest leader India has produced. And number two, ensure that you have a proper succession plan. Somebody who has very similar values. I think that is the only way of trying to maximize the probability of continuing the culture of the organization. There's no other way. Often succession plans don't go well or fall into place. You're telling me? <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, on the issue of succession, Mr. Murthy, and I think, again, uh, this, is, this is a dilemma that many founders and you yourself, I know, have dealt with uh, uh, when the seven of you decided that it is going to be by rotation first and then eventually you decided to go down the professional CEO route, which didn't exactly take off the way that you had hoped it would to start with. Uh, but the, the, the timing uh, of when to professionalize uh, and how that changes the nature of the game as well. Uh, what is it, in your experience now, after having gone through what you've gone through, uh, your learnings? No, I mean, uh, I don't want to speak of any no, I'm not, specific I'm not examples. Yeah. However, I will give you the generic inferences which will apply to all the uh, companies. What I would say is that you, the founders, should not vacate your place all at the same time. When you bring an outsider who is new to this culture, who comes from a different culture, understandable, there's nothing, you know, that's his or her culture. Who, are, who, are, who am I to say that's wrong, this is right, no. The best thing to do is to have a mix of old culture which will have reasonably good influence and bring in the new culture so that the new culture 
can then join the mainstream of old culture. I think that is the best way to do. If you want to enhance the probability of the success of retaining the old culture. That's what I would say. So, so that there's a merger uh, and a co-mingling, so to speak, a fusion of yeah. the old and the new. That's right. <clears throat> that is, the old culture should have pretty good influence in terms of decision making, in terms of values and all that. Mm. No, but you know, when do you think it's, it's the right time to bring a professional CEO on board, especially in, in, in today's context of the startups that are scaling and scaling so quickly? I mean, in a matter of a few years, you go from a million to 10 million to 100 million customers and so on and so forth. And perhaps there is some degree of investor pressure as well uh, to bring a professional CEO on board. Uh, but the founder at the end of the day has skin in the game. So when do you believe it's the right time or what should be the rationale or the drivers of bringing a professional CEO on board? You know, I don't have enough data points to comment on that because, you know, I gave up voluntarily when I reached 55. Fortunately, my successor was from internal stuff. So, and I, I'm also, I also don't read management books, let me say this, because my late friend, Raul Bajaj, taught me a very important lesson. I, you know, may his soul rest in peace. I have tremendous respect for him. He's, in 1992, I was a wannabe and I, went and met him in Akurdi, in Bajaj <laughs> Ato. You know, I, mean, I was trembling because this guy was very imposing. I was a nobody. So, he said, what do you want? So, I asked him, you know, should I have a management guru? He says, forget about all of that. Your competition is your best management guru. Competition will teach you to keep your customers happy, to provide better value for money to your customers, to keep your employees happy, to uh, make sure that your investors are happy. All those things will automatically come if you embrace competition with open mind. That lesson which I learned from my revered senior, late Raul Bajaj, I think is all that matters. So competition is, I don't know where, where, why I went to, uh, I forgot the question. No, the question was when, when is it a good time to professionalize and bring an outsider in, at least in the context of No, 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 <laughs> then you went to something else. Did no, I? I answered that saying that I don't have you enough have, don't data. You don't have enough data points. I don't have enough data points. <laughs> then you said you so don't like management you, you books. Can't, you can't draw a line with one point. Yeah. See, you need at least two points. Fair point. Right? So, I will be the wrong person to answer that question. Fair point. But you know, I want to understand from no, you. No, this competition, you asked some other question. Did that I way. ask another question? I, 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 now, I'm, I'm lost now. I'm not sure if I did ask <laughs> another question or not, but we got another very interesting insight from you and another very important lesson, uh, thanks to the late Rahul Bajaj. But you know, what I want to understand from you, Mr. Murthy, is uh, hmm. the way that you see uh, the changes as far as the macros are concerned in the economy that we speak of today in the context of technology. Uh, you know, most countries at this point in time are looking at bringing in legislations, bringing in regulations. So, you know, technology was supposed to make the world borderless, but now we are putting in legislations and regulations to bring the borders back and set in boundaries. I mean, data localization could be just one example of what is being attempted to be done. How do you see that impacting and changing the course of the way that companies will, will have to structure themselves, will have to address markets, address customers going forward? You know, I think it was uh, in Davos in late 90s. I don't remember the person who told me. It may have been Rick Wagoner 
who was then the CEO of General Motors. We were having lunch or something. <laughs> so I asked him about this competition thing. Uh, I quoted Rahul and all of that. And Rahul was also there. He says, let me tell you one uh, secret. He said, every, com every CEO will extol the virtue of competition in public. But he will do everything possible under him to stifle the competition. <laughs> that is the reality. So what I am saying is this, that this regulations, this stifling of uh, success from foreign companies, this will continue. This was there earlier in different forms. It is there today in a different form. That will continue. What is the antidote? What is the solution? There is only one solution. You know, I used to tell my colleagues that, look, whenever we are confronted with a problem, first think of what is it that you can do to solve that problem before you start blaming the environment, that fellow, this fellow, all of that. So my view is, work harder, become more innovative, provide better value for money, then it doesn't matter what the regulations come, what the government says, the corporations will inevitably buy more and more from you. Because the CEOs are bothered about value accruing to them. They are bothered about reducing their cost. They are, they are bothered about improving their productivity. They are bothered about better market access. If your solution, if your product makes them look smarter in front of their customers, it doesn't matter what regulations are there, they will find a way to do you mean that H1B and all we know, yeah, right? That's yeah. exactly what happened. So focus on internally what you can do to make your corporation stronger and stronger and stronger because that's the thing over which you have control. You don't have control over what uh, other person can do. So forget about that. That comes later on, secondary. I'm not saying that, don't worry about it, but first think of what you can do. That's yes, my view. Absolutely. So control what you can and don't worry about the external environment yeah. because that you have no control over. That's right. Let, let me end by asking you, Mr. Murthy, how confident do you feel about the strength of the Indian startup story today, about the strength of the India innovation story today? And would you rather have been CEO now? Uh, or do you believe that, you know, wh when you were CEO, that was the best time? No, I mean, compared to when we started, today it's just unbelievable, unbelievable what progress India has made. You know, when in the late 70s, when I used to go to the US, India was seen as a filthy country, full of poverty and all of that. At that time, there were not even uh, uh, people of Indian origin who had become CEOs, who had reached all of that. And the number of Indians succeeding in the valley was also not, was very few. So India didn't, nobody listened to India. Getting even a meeting with a director in a company was very difficult. But today, Thanks to all the wonderful people assembled here. Thanks to Silicon Valley. Thanks to Indians in Silicon Valley. Thanks to people like Satya, Sundar, uh, you know, Rajat Gupta and many others who rose to their top on a global scenario. I think the friction to access for Indian ideas 
has reduced quite a lot, number one. Number two, the fact that some of the countries have somehow got saturated in innovation, more and more money has flown to India through VC channel and all of that. So my personal view is this is the best time to be an entrepreneur in India. And my best wishes to every one of you and you will all succeed. But don't worry about it. No success can ever be achieved without going through some difficulties. Otherwise, success will not mean anything. If you are all the time eating sugar, 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 if I gave you some more sugar, you will not even feel the difference. On the other hand, if I gave you some bitter stuff, you know, incident, my father on the Ugadi day, he used to make every one of his children sit on the floor. Of course, we didn't have chairs and all at home. And then he would give us a, a little bit of jaggery and neem. We had to eat both. We would try to throw neem and then eat jaggery. He said, no, you have to eat both. So we asked him, why? He said, what Ugadi, the New Year does is, on that day we take a vow that the coming year will be, will have happy events and there will be some unhappy events. God, give me equanimity to face the two and succeed. So therefore, you will have problems because without problems, your life will be boring. <laughs> so I have full confidence in every one of you. You will all succeed. And second question, you put me on the mat there. <laughs> you have the right, as I've always said. I wouldn't want to be an entrepreneur today because I don't have that smartness to succeed like many of you have done. I am amazed at the hard work, at the ingenuity, at the confidence uh, I, you know, of the current day entrepreneurs. And they are fighting a bigger battle, as I said right in the beginning. In a situation where market access is difficult, where talent access is difficult, you people are managing these two battles. I don't know if I would have managed that battle. That's what I would say. Mr. Murthy, Thank your, you. your humility, your grace, your dignity uh, is, is unparalleled and it always remains so. So thank you very, very thank much for a very, thank very you. inspirational 45 minutes. <laughs> Appreciate your time as always. And, and may your life lessons inspire the room full of entrepreneurs here to make better choices as we move Thanks. forward. Appreciate Thanks. your time. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Wonderful.